We were doing a shelter, and I was there, and I had the, the um, water, and that's all I did was drink the water. And it was like each bottle I drank, the worse I got. And I had nothing else um, to eat or anything. There was nothing, you know, nothing else that I was ingesting at all. So that was actually a blessing because I was able to narrow it down. There must be, this must be it. Um, and I went around and I had the bottle and I was asking everybody, what's in this bottle? What is aspartame? And, you know, everybody said they had no idea. Um, and then that one lady had uh, said, she goes, well, and she goes, I've heard of it, she said. And then something kept flashing my mind and I remembered seeing the name somewhere. And I, I, like I said, I read all the time in magazines and all that. And I don't know if it was in Time or Newsweek or something, but I remember seeing an article and for some reason I keep saying that name. So uh, after I had uh, finished the shelter, I went and I was driving down the road and my library, I volunteered at the library also. And so I stopped in there to say hello and all that and see how everything was going. And they actually had power there. And I went in, I pulled it up on a computer at that time. I didn't have a computer. And I'd never searched anything in my life. I had no clue. I didn't have email and that's about it. Um, and I pulled up aspartame and I just, my eyes lit up. I started crying. I was all those symptoms are 92 symptoms. I think, I think I counted 79 of those symptoms. I've been in the hospital or, or to the doctors in complaints over 50 times for each one of them, well over. Turns out his wife was told she had lupus. She doesn't. They were getting ready to tell her she had multiple sclerosis, and she didn't. Her husband went home and jumped all over her and made her stop drinking the diet drinks, and all of a sudden things got a lot better for her. Yep. That's basically how it happened with me, Corey. I put the diet drink down, and I didn't touch it again. This was on a Friday. I think it was around the 19th of September. Last year? Yeah. And my husband looked at me, and he says, the next day, within 24 hours, she says, Baby, you're not slurring like you were. You're not falling down like you were either. And over time, it got better and got better and got better. Because I was such a high user of aspartame through primarily Diet Cokes and Equal, and uh, those, those are the primary ways, combined with the mountain of evidence and, and other testimonials of people who have have had uh, terrible symptoms of every type of malady that you can imagine. And when they're removed from the aspartame, the symptoms go away. That's what you call strong, if not direct evidence, very strong circumstantial evidence. Judge Wood, the judge I used to work for, the federal judge, <clears throat> uh, in his charge to the jury, when he would give a definition of circumstantial evidence, he would say, if, as you go to bed at night, there's no snow on the ground, and you wake up in the morning, and there's snow on the ground, you may reasonably assume that during the course of the night, it snowed. That is an example of circum strong circumstantial evidence. You didn't see it snow. You can't <laughs> scientifically prove that the snow fell from the sky, but it wasn't there at night, and in the morning it was. Therefore, you may conclude circumstantially that it snowed during the course of the night. And I would say that the evidence of, of, of my brain tumors being caused by aspartame are, are that strong to me. And then they rechallenge themselves knowingly or inadvertently. They serve something in a neighbor's house that they didn't realize contained an aspartame product. And these set of symptoms and problems promptly recur within hours or a day or two, sometimes within minutes, and it does so repeatedly, then that is more than anecdotal. Uh, that is similar like the cock postulates for infection. Uh, you isolate the cause, and then you inject an animal, and you reproduce the problem. And many of these individuals who had been aspartame reactors have tested themselves 5, 10, 20 times, every time getting the same response. And then they realized that this was a legitimate cause and effect relationship. My, my personal experience, from my own experience and with patients, is that when somebody who's been poisoned by this goes off it, they very quickly 
notice an improvement. And they almost equally quickly find out that it isn't over yet. You know, they've got a lot of problems to deal with. And certainly uh, because I had to suffer with this and had patient groups that had to suffer with it, and then I would consult with doctors around the nation who were pretty much expert in, in the field of environmental ecology, I developed some therapeutic outlooks that people can have to, uh, to help themselves. But the, the first thing you've got to learn is to listen to your body. If, if something's going wrong, try and backtrack to what you had or what you're breathing in your environment or what's going on around you. But the fact is this thing has been carefully studied, repeatedly studied, extensively studied, so that, as I said before, the FDA concluded it's one of the most thoroughly tested food additives they've ever seen. And the conclusion is that it's safe. They had made the claim years ago that they would help and support any legitimate researcher, that they would supply aspartame and be helpful in any research. I had published my anecdotal studies, and I had uh, written a chapter in Richard Wortman's book, so I, I think the industry knew of my stance already. But then, in the mid-90s, I wrote to the company stating that we wanted to do a double-blind study, because my earlier work had indeed been, quote, anecdotal. And I pointed out that they had made the claim that they would supply aspartame to any legitimate researcher. At that point, I was a professor at near UConn, Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine. I think I would qualify as a legitimate researcher. The company, uh, I sent the protocol for the study to the company. And they responded that this was unnecessary res research and would not supply us with aspartame. I offered to buy the aspartame. They refused. They put up roadblocks. They made it very difficult for us to purchase aspartame. We had to go around them. We finally did get USP-grade aspartame from Schweitzer, from a private firm. But the point is that the NutraSweet company made it very, very difficult, didn't follow through on their promise to supply aspartame to any legitimate researcher, said this was unnecessary, shouldn't be done, needn't be done. They tried to block it. The G.D. Searle Company, in the quest to get approval for their product, uh, aspartame, they uh, conducted a study on animals in which they fed some animals, like I said, low dose, medium dose, high dose of the uh, product, and then they used control animals that supposedly did not get any of the product. Uh, when they submitted this to the FDA and the FD, FDA looked at it, there was some question about the study. Well, one of the scientists and neuroscientists looked at some of this and uh, he saw a lot of red flags. He said there's some real questions here about tumors being caused by this product, particularly brain tumors. Uh, so they uh, ordered a study to be done by the Bureau of Foods, uh, which was the precursor to the FDA. And uh, Dr. Jerome Bressler was in charge of this uh, group to, to look through this, the research that had been done by G.D. Searle, and that's what the Bressler reported about. And this is the uh, report here. And basically what it shows is that either a lot of purposeful shenanigans was carried on to get this product approved, or, as he states it, it was the world's worst research. They found that uh, what they did is the animals that died after being fed NutraSweet, they didn't autopsy the animals right away. Uh, some of them were not autopsied more than a year afterwards. And of course the tissues broke down and, and liquefied and so they couldn't do proper studies on them, but they reported it as if they had. And they reported these as normal. Uh, they found that they were taking tumors and cutting them out and throwing them away and saying the animal was normal. Uh, they had animal tissues that had obvious tumors in it that were reported normal. They had, uh, in one of the cases here that's reported, a, a lymph node that was enlarged. And uh, this G.D. Serral pathologist reported it as a normal lymph node. When the scientists from the Bureau of Foods looked at it, uh, they said it was an obvious lymphosarcoma, a highly malignant tumor. Uh, the uh, notations about the testicular atrophy were not noted. Uh, 
there were just numerous, numerous things in this, uh, this report that showed that, uh, in my estimation, there was an effort to cover up what was being found so that they could get approval. 